So what I would like to do is to pose two questions to our panelists and invite them to make their, their comments in that respect. My first question is as follows. Often when we think about energy security, we think about gas for obvious reasons seen in the news recently. So let's start with gas. We all know that in some of the regions of the European Union, we do not have markets categorized by liquid competitive gas supplies. And the energy union, one of the objectives of the energy union is to change this, is to ensure that every citizen in the European Union has liquid competitive gas markets providing security and competitiveness. Secondly, it's very clear that one of the objectives of the energy union is to, make, is to improve the EU's ability to speak with one voice, which will be a key issue in terms of increasing the liquidity, increasing the diversity of our supplies. When we talk about a Mediterranean gas hub, when we talk about additional supplies from the Caspian, from the Levant Basin, from Algeria, this will be key. So, panelists, how are we going to make this happen? Perhaps I can start, um, can I start with the Member of Parliament? Yes, thank you very much. Would you allow me to show three pictures, quickly? Uh, here's the first picture. Uh, we all know from reading the paper that we live in a very green environment. Uh, we're very focused on renewables, focused on uh, uh, decreasing our dependence on fossil fuels, but when, when we look at the actual energy consumption in Europe, we are very far from it. 34% petroleum, so that's basically uh, uh, gas, diesel, uh, petrol, diesel, 23% gas, 17% uh, coal, 14% nuclear, 11% green. It's growing. We're not green. We are extremely fossil fuel dependent. That's picture one. Picture two is of these fossil fuels, my God, we import almost all of them. So 86% of the consumed oil and the petroleum in the EU is imported, and 66% of the gas is imported. Europe's own production is on a downward slope, not on an upward slope. And picture number three, take a look at the countries where we're importing these commodities from. The largest single uh, supplier for both of these commodities is Russia. The second largest is Norway for uh, both. And then we get to countries like uh, Nigeria, Libya, Kazakhstan, Iraq, uh, uh, countries that maybe don't to a European's mind come as the most stable, at least politi political environments. So what we need, I think, is to understand that we talk the green talk, but we don't walk the green walk. And in order to decrease our dependency on supplies coming from these, to my view, and not only, politically questionably stable regions, especially Russia, which is now using energy as an overt weapon, there are four things. It's the grid interconnections. Uh, it's diversification of source improving efficiency and increasing and incorporating the renewables. And it's all of these things together that we have to work on at one time. It's, you, you can't compartmentalize, I believe. You have to look at the whole picture. But in terms of Europe as a whole, our situation is indeed uh, rather precarious when it comes to the security of supply. Thank you. Sandrine. Sure. Um, building on that excellent presentation, because actually it was very similar to what I was going to say. I think the key is the fact that we are import dependent. And hence what we need to look at is how both supply and demand management can reduce our import dependency. So I would fully agree that we need to, first of all, diversify in terms of those imports that we currently have regarding gas. We need to look at the possible gas structure in Europe. But one way to offset our dependency on imports is to very much look at how we can actually increase energy efficiency. 
There have been a series of studies that have been undertaken actually by the BPIE, the Buildings Performance Institute and others who have indicated that we could actually replace our dependency on Russian gas simply by putting in place strong renovation policies across, across households. So, so I would say that the trick here is clearly trying to figure out how we can get new sources potentially of gas, how we can enhance the sources that we have, but also to very much look at our supply and demand balance as a growing focus on demand management rather than just supply. And the last thing I would say, and this is slightly outside of the scope of your question, but what I heard this morning was quite heartening in terms of the terminology of making sure that we had a linked up climate and energy union. What I would like to see now is how that's integrated into practice. Because when you go into different national departments or countries across Europe, there is still a total dichotomy between the way in which we speak between energy ministers, climate ministers, finance ministers, and market stability or any of the internal market ministers and economics ministers. And until we actually link up all four of those different types of focus areas into an integrated plan, a grand marshal plan for, you, for Europe, we will then be able to get this right. Thank you. Uh, Adam? Mm, well, if we are speaking about the energy security and gas supplies, I think uh, in, the, in the one notion of the energy union, I think we have to, to remember and to come back to the, to the origin of those efforts in Europe. And I would like to remind everybody that the first notion came as early as in 19. 90 in the Ruud Lubbers plan. It was creating energy, European energy communities. And this idea is, re is evolving and coming back reg regularly after every 10, 15 years back on the agenda. And Energy Charter has been rooted in this very first attempt of uh, Ruud Luber then to create uh, something which will unify the energy policies in Europe and beyond, uh, beyond Europe. And I think we are living in a very stressful time, so everything is changing. So the global patterns of consumption and production, there's a technology challenge, disruptive innovation, and there's a price volatility, and there's very little what governments can control under such a volatile environment, but rules and regulation. So I, I very much advocate that uh, whatsoever European Union and Energy Union should be built upon, should be built on the same basic rules, set of the basic rules and principles, which is common not only in Europe in the form of the Energy Charter Treaty, which is part of the acquis as of 1998, but which Europe shares with its immediate neighbors on the east, and which we are promoting to become a standard, a golden, golden standard for energy cooperation in a broader sense. So I think that uh, we have to build up the energy union based on a, a common, commonly shared rules of the game, with not only within the Europe and the energy community, but is a broader uh, global environment. And regarding to the gas, indeed, everybody is uh, aware of the, of the sad and tragic events in, in uh, Ukraine. But uh, I would like to underline that unlike in 2006 and 2009, in 2014, we haven't seen a transit disruptions from the gas flows from Russia through Ukraine to Europe. And I think it was, it's a very little known of the big work was Energy Charter was doing together with Commission. We have been much more behind the scene, but working very hard to, to keep the transit flows going on because we be very much believe in the current circumstance to keeping the transit flow through Ukraine was, a, was the energy security solution, not only for the European Union, but also for Ukraine itself. Thank you very much. Now, Hetjan. Um, sorry, I want to squeeze you a bit. Um, because in terms of gas supplies, at the end of the day, the European Union, our heads of state, the Commission, can talk about the need to diversify sources, the need to create liquid markets. But we're not going to do that. You're going to do that, the gas industry. So the real question is, what do you need from the energy union strategy in order to make this happen? Thank you very much for making the question more focused in that way, Christopher. Um, let me start by saying that I very much agree with the four points that were raised by Mr. Karinch. 
And I would say that if you translate that into action, um, the first point would be, let's prioritize where the infrastructure bottlenecks are. Let's prioritize the repair of that. Um, we, we always talk about priorities, but then we have so many priorities that you don't see what they are. So really prioritize, together with the TSOs, what are the bottlenecks for a well-functioning gas market. But because let's realize, you, you mentioned that there are some regions where the gas market is not functioning very well, but in a large part of Europe, in the northwest of Europe, where 60% of the gas consumption is today, the, the internal market for gas is a success. And I think that success can be translated also to the south and the east of Europe. It must be translated there. So first of all, you need infrastructure. You may say, well, let's not waste too much money on infrastructure, it's a risk. But gas infrastructure is relatively very cheap. When you have to transport energy and you do it in the form of gas, that is 10 to 20 times cheaper than transferring energy in the form of electricity. 10 to 20 times cheaper. So that's one. The second is put the TSOs in those regions where there's not a well-functioning internal market yet around the table. And learn together from the lessons that you can see from the success of the MBP in the UK and the TTF in the Netherlands. Very well-functioning liquid hubs. How were they created? What were the success factors behind it? And take those lessons and use them to create those liquid hubs in the south and the east of Europe. And then my third message or my third action point would be invite new suppliers. We can talk about the wish of becoming more energy independent in Europe, but the reality is that we will remain dependent on imports for a long time to come. So independency should not be a goal in itself. And, and we heard the Norwegian minister this morning. He said, we need security of demand. Now, what kind of message is it to him when we say, we don't, well, well, we need your gas, ship it to us, but we don't want it actually. That is not the right message to external suppliers. So I think that we should not aim at reducing the number of buyers when we, when we uh, go externally to get gas to Europe we need to increase the number of suppliers. And the signal should be that they are welcome in the most interconnected, competitive, liquid and reliable market in the world. And that is the European Energy Union. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, can I take up on that last point about inviting suppliers and security of demand? Because energy security is not just about gas, as Sandrine was mentioning. There's more way of killing a cat than filling it with cream. We know that we have said we will have a 40% CO2 cut by 2030. We know that in the event, sorry, when we get a global agreement on climate change, we will have an 80% cut in the EU. The maths doesn't make it otherwise. It's difficult to see how an 80% cut means anything different than a zero carbon power industry, a zero carbon transport industry, and a zero carbon housing sector, building sector. So if I'm a supplier from Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, Algeria, you'd be right in saying, well, hang on a minute, you're saying in 2050 you don't need any more gas, are you? So the question, it's, it's a wide question I've got for you, um, is how do we get the trajectory from here till 2050 right in terms of the balance? How do we get the priorities right? What should our priorities be? And how do we integrate the gas supplies that we need between now and 2050 and beyond in terms of balancing the renewables, whatever it may be, how do we get that balance right moving forward? And perhaps I can um, ask the same order of speakers on that. Thank you very much. No small question. Uh, I think the answer is uh, you have to make sure that the market incentives are correct. Uh, so the, the idea of the lawmakers' idea of 
prodding industry to make the right investments is through the, uh, say, the emission trading system, whose idea was to have a high enough cost of carbon emissions so that companies would invest in uh, lower emittive uh, technologies, whether it be green technologies or clean coal, which is not yet a reality commercially because of the low price of carbon. The difficulty is, is that when politicians created this market system, the market gave the answer that the politicians didn't want because the price went too low. So then we tinkered with it. That's what politicians do. We uh, backloaded, we took out 900 million allowances uh, with the idea that the price would then uh, go up. The price went up by a couple of percentage points. It's still extremely low. Um, so what are politicians in the process of doing now? Um, we're tinkering again. And we're, we're trying to find the correct mechanism. Uh, we're waiting, as Mr. Cagnetta said earlier, that the Commission is going to come at the uh, second half of this year with a revised approach to carbon trading. But I think in the end, it's a question how we factor in the societal cost of high carbon emissions uh, to give industry the, the correct prods. I don't think we have it right as politicians right now. I'm personally inclined to think that a carbon tax is probably the best way to go. Uh, and in times now when energy costs, fossil fuel costs are down, now is the time we could do it. But to get 28 member states to agree on a carbon tax, um, I don't know, uh, that's extremely optimistic. So the end, is, I th the end result, I think, will be that, well, unfortunately, we're going to muddle through, as we often do in Europe, but I think that would need to be the goal because if we don't have the right market incentives, industry will not invest and, and we won't get from point A to point B. So continuing on that, actually, I'd like to first say one thing, and, and I think that was very clear from the speeches that we heard this morning from the IA and also a series of different meetings we've been having with the OECD, the IEA, Christiana Figueres herself, coal companies across the world, that we're not doing this in isolation. So that's my first point. And that's really important to remember that actually the world is moving on. And if we want to get onto that ship, we better jump on quickly. If we want to create jobs, growth, and competitiveness in Europe, then we actually need to make sure that we have in place, as I said, this grand Marshall plan. And, and that includes a European energy investment strategy. That includes exactly as has been said, creating the right conditions for both companies, whether they are low carbon technology suppliers or energy intensives, to stay in Europe and decarbonize jointly together. And so how do you actually do that? Well, we've been looking with the European Climate Foundation and other think tanks and others to try to figure out the best way forward. And we've also been having conversations with investors. Clearly the long-term planning horizon is absolutely fundamental and we'd hope that the ETS would help us in doing that. The low carbon price has been an issue, but I would say that markets are tinkered with all the time. This is not the first case where we've tinkered with a market. So we do need to get it right. Let's just make sure we get it right this time and we start to increase our carbon price so it does give the right signal. We need to look at different tariff schemes, maybe a carbon tax, and there is a reopening of that whole conversation, though politically it was a no-go, which is why we went for the ETS. But we need to look at other types of tariff schemes. Does that mean border tariff schemes? We had a long conversation with the OECD about this and also the WTO. Does it mean that we need to very carefully pick feed-in tariff schemes and design them properly, excuse me, <clears throat> because we haven't done so in many cases, hence why we've had the backtracking in Spain and the Czech Republic, which has created complete confusion for investors. We also need to ensure we have an internal energy market that functions, and those signals need to be correct. That's what investors are calling for. And then we need a clear distinction between enhancing the scalability of existing technologies, because most of our solutions are here. Renewables prices are going down. Okay, it's difficult now that the price of oil has gone down, but that's cyclical, and we have to plan for the long term. 
So we need to very carefully look at the scalability of existing solutions and how we can actually enable those technologies to come to market swifter, but also look at breakthrough technologies. And this is some of the work that we're doing with energy intensives. We also need to bring in some new actors. The energy intensive sectors are now looking at demand management possibilities and how they can be part of the system. We need to look at the smart grid guys, the digital guys, the ones who actually can really transform the system. And then we carefully need to also look at the prosumer, the citizen, because we haven't talked about that yet, and I think that's very important. So in terms of enabling that diversification, in terms of moving towards full decarbonization by 2050 and hitting net zero goals, it will take a series of new actors. And I come back to my point, do we have the political will and do we actually have the integrated system at the national level to carry this out? And I don't think we do for the moment. So I would say we have the solutions in front of us. Most of the business community and investors are ready to ta take part in this, but I'm not sure that we have the brave leadership that we need. Thank you. Adam. Well, <clears throat> Christopher, I would like to come back to your introductory words about the energy security and how to, to define this. And we have uh, been uh, listening today morning to the, to the speech and address of the Norwegian minister. I think we have to recognize in, in Europe, and it's a high time uh, to, to, to have a, a frank discussion. We have started this, by the way, in the Energy Charter. How to redefine energy security? The original notion of energy security was very much on the security of supply. This is what the European Energy Charter is about. Energy security equals to energy su security of supply, which is fair. But then some of the questions coming up, as you have mentioned, yes, there's a concern of producers. What to do? How they could plan their long-term investment? to feed us between now and 2050. So we will, if they will stop to invest right now, so we will be, the pr price of energy will go up to, the, up to the roof and we will be in the deep problems in the future. So we very much believe that security of demand has to be discussed as well as a part of the energy security. Well, now, would energy security of supply and security of demand would, would be enough from the global perspective? I think not, because we have seen in, a, in a many occasions that uh, the safety or security of the transit be on the, on the, on the on shore, transit pipelines, on off, or offshore, the issue of the piracy is the key element to the equation as well. So security of the transportation and transit should be also ensured if we are looking for the global energy security solution. At last but not least, and I think which was echoed also today morning, is the absence of energy poverty. Let's, let's, find, let's try to redefine energy security along those four lines, security of supply, security of demand, security of transit, and absence of energy poverty. Because only such a world would allow Europe to, to flourish and to be part and to compete on the, on the global market for energy in all, all forms of energy which are available. And I think we have to, in this transitory period, to keep in mind the way that we have to ensure also affordable energy in all parts of the Europe. So we are not a luxury to, to exclude any of sort of energy for energy mix right now. Because the te technological risk and the disruptive innovation doesn't give the investors enough clue where to invest, what to do, what to do right now, whether we should invest to nuclear or to, or to, uh, to gas power plant or uh, only to renewables. So the, the, clear, the answers are not yet here on the commercial scale. I would like to also to, to point out the role of the outside world. Well, Europe is not a trendsetter, not, nor a price setter in energy cooperation. We have seen the development in China or US could very much influence the European energy market and how, the, the way how we interact with our immediate neighborhood. And I think that we are, in Europe, is too much inward looking. Even Russia is not a trendsetter. So the trendsetters are now in the, in the Far East and this is a Pacific Rim. I think we have to be aware that China is very much looking forward to set up the way of cooperating with the, with the, on the global scale. They're looking for a, for a set of the rules how to be a part of the global energy architecture. And we are very pleased to see that China is getting closer and closer to the energy charter. We very much believe that it will be a win-win situation if we'll be able to promote a rules-based system of energy cooperation which will be not which will, which will be incorporate the European core values as uh, freedom, free markets, as competitiveness, as protection of investment, but also the sovereignty over national resources. Because without the external world, uh, Europe will be not able in a foreseeable future to address the energy security needs uh, on its own. 
And the last but not least in this, in this point, I would like to, to underline the work what we are doing right now to, to engage with the countries beyond the traditional energy charter membership. To address those issues, we have started three years ago a so-called Warsaw process to, to renegotiate energy charter, which is a basic document, the European Energy Charter of 1991, to be complemented with a new international energy charter, hopefully in 2015. And we are very grateful to the government of Netherlands to, to inviting the new countries to come to the Netherlands in the 2021st of May for the new ministerial conference on the energy charter, where we hope that more than 80 countries will, from all, all around the world will share the principles of the energy cooperation under the new international energy charter. Thank you very much. Urban mentioned affordability, and I think that's a very important word. If we want to make a successful transition to a more CO2-free energy economy, we have to do it in the most cost-effective manner. Consumers are not stupid. We heard it this morning. If they discover that our climate policy is done in a way which favors one or another technology, and makes it, in this way, more expensive, more, less cost-effective than when you do it through the instrument, which is the price, they will sooner or later s uh, stop their support for it. And we need the consumer, we need society to make that transition. So for me, the key element is that we have a te technology-neutral transition in which the ETS, the price of carbon, is key. And then it must be an open competition between all sources of energy. And it must be combinations of energy. Of course, we must not look at isolation for gas or electricity or what other fuels we have. It is an energy world, and we need to take the most cost-effective way to CO2 reduction. Now, what does that mean for the external suppliers of gas, for instance? It's strange for them to see that when Europe says we have climate intentions, strong climate intentions, that Europe at the moment favors to burn coal in power plants over gas, um, then the CO2 price is not the correct one. We must make it a serious price. So reparation of the ETS is, is, is absolutely key. If you want to do something on technology, it must be an R&D. That's where we have to invest heavily to make um, renewable energy more competitive. Um, if you look at the longer term, and that was also an element of your question, what, what will this mean for gas suppliers when they look beyond 2030 and to 2050 and beyond? CCS is also an option, which is now in the R&D stadium still, which is not accepted so good in society, but we, we must work on it. First for coal, but after 2030, certainly it's also an option for gas. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Folks, what I'd like to do now is I've got one more question for two of you, then I'd like to ask some questions from the audience, and then at the end I'll give you all one minute, one minute each to answer the question, what's the five things that need to be in the energy security paper? But very concrete, okay? Now the last question I had, um, and that's for uh, Christianis and for Gertian. Um, if we were sitting here in the US, we'd be talking about something different. We'd be talking about shale gas, we'd be talking about domestic production, we'd be talking about Keystone, et cetera, et cetera. We wouldn't be talking about imports. Um, I think I'm correct in saying that we talk a lot about um, uh, the gas coming from Azerbaijan, 10 BCM, but we'll lose that 10 BCM in domestic production by the time that that gas arrives. Um, we have domestic resources in the European Union. We have shale gas, we have other domestic gas. There are other choices for domestic production. So um, we know these are politically difficult. Can I ask Christianis and Kers Gertian, what do you think that we should do on these? Is it a lost opportunity? What to do? Uh, thank you very much. I, well. If the resources are sitting beneath the ground, it's not a lost opportunity, it's a potential opportunity. Uh, they're not going anywhere. Uh, the question is, should we be getting at them? Uh, my answer is, uh, I think it's uh, 
not very far-sighted for some member states to ban even exploration of these potential resources. Uh, because uh, certainly, when, if you remember the pictures I showed you, uh, most of our energy consumption is fossil fuels. I don't think that with the best of efforts, we're going to really get completely away from them anytime soon, which means technologies to reduce CO2 using these same resources, but also uh, looking at uh, potential usage of, say, shale gas, which we apparently do have underneath the ground, especially in France, uh, which has banned uh, the research, uh, uh, to explore the opportunity of actually exploiting these resources. We know that in the U.S., in Pennsylvania, in the Dakotas, um, in, in Texas, there's not so many people per square kilometer. So there are fewer environmental um, concerns, or perhaps there are just fewer environmental protesters around. The concerns may be the same. But assuming that this can be overcome uh, through safeguards and proper uh, drilling methods, proper well seals, uh, I think this is a resource that could very much help us to decrease our import dependency. That's what the U.S. has done. So you have, we're now introducing another vector. We talked about reducing our CO2 footprint. But reducing import dependency would mean, to my view, using more renewables, but also then using that which we have underneath the ground. And when we speak with our Polish colleagues, uh, we know that Poland has a lot of coal in their energy mix under the ground. For them to move away from coal essentially means to move to gas, which practically means importing more from Russia, which politically is not a choice that any Pole would make, and I certainly would not recommend it to any Polish politician. Uh, then the question is, well, what to do about that? Because the consumers, the industry also need the cost, as which, which was mentioned. And one of the answers is, well, the clean coal technologies, but that actually requires a penalty, a, a high cost of, of carbon emissions to make that technology worth its while. So it becomes actually quite complex when we start to tease it apart. But I, for one, think that the indigenous resources that we have, including renewables, as Mr. Buzek said in his address, should be used uh, maximally, of course, uh, adhering to all uh, uh, climate, uh, that is, environmental considerations. Thank you. Gertjan, are we going to see a gas revolution in Europe? Well, a lot has to change before we see that. Um, first of all, we have to stop, to stop saying no before we even know what we're talking about. We think there is shale gas, but we have hardly had any exploration in Europe, so we are not really sure about it. So first of all, we should get a bit more curious about it and, and, and try to find out what we're really talking about. Um, I think we should never give in on our environmental standards, which we have in Europe for the mining industry, which are good standards, and um, we must make clear to the, to the public that those standards are reliable. Um, then, I think, if you look at the success in the US and, and, and the problems in Europe, there's also another thing we, we must have an open eye for, and that is um, the, the government take. I think in the US, the, the fiscal regime, the ownership of the resources is much different from Europe. And as long as that keeps the same in Europe as it is today, where all the resources are owned by the government and, and, and um, uh, the taxation on, on gas production is uh, above 50%, 50, 60, 70%, um, shale gas will not be a success in Europe. So there are a lot of factors to work on. First of all, it's credibility, it is, it is acceptance with the public. I think that we have to start. Thank you very much. I'm aware that we certainly have one question. Um, Stefan Schauer from the Coalition for Energy Savings. Is he around here somewhere? He's there. Uh, there's a microphone coming. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan Scheuer, Coalition for Energy Savings, bringing together industrial, uh, civil society, and also trade union uh, professional actors on uh, calling for energy efficiency being a top priority. Um, I think uh, in, the, in the first round, uh, we very much uh, saw a growing recognition for the importance of energy efficiency um, for the overall energy union. I think this is something very clear in terms of uh, the economic sense it makes. I mean, as long as we waste energy, uh, it seems to be economic 
incompetence, uh, sort of wasting money and therefore a very risky uh, uh, step. Uh, so we need to step up energy efficiency. I think that was a very clear message coming from there. But now translating that into this uh, part uh, of the energy union, the security question. Um, I mean, I want to test with you. I mean, we are calling for a savings test um, to be introduced here to make sure that we have an overarching organizing principle for the sector's planning decisions uh, in order to check whether energy efficiency is the more cost-effective uh, and, and therefore also cheaper solution uh, and should be uh, prioritized. Uh, so shouldn't we such, uh, as such introduce a savings test also for the security uh, uh, chapter uh, of a coming energy union? Thank you very much. I'm willing to take one more question if anybody's... Uh Don't have any. I've got one more question over there. Uh, thank you, Chair. My name is Brooke Riley. I'm with the NGO Friends of the Earth. Um, I've heard a lot of talk today about gas, and it's kind of a repetition of gas, gas, gas pipelines, LNG terminals. It's it's a bit monotonous, surely, when we know that pipelines, LNG terminals, take at least ten years to build, and at the same time, as, as Mr. Jones has pointed out, we have the EU's ambitious climate commitments to cut greenhouse gas emissions by up to 95% by 2050. So surely we face the risk of throwing hundreds of billions of euros into stranded assets, which we will have to decommission almost as soon as they come online, if we are to meet our greenhouse gas commitments. So can you help me figure out this puzzle? Surely it means prioritizing efficiency and renewables to a degree which we are not currently doing at the moment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Right then, panel, one minute each for what's your blueprint for the energy union? What are the, one of the three, four, five things that you really want to see in the document that's, pr that's uh, published on the 25th of February, and what do you want to see happen over the next, the, the course of this commission? Shall, shall we start with Christianis and then go along? Um, sure. Uh, five things. Um, one, uh, grid interconnections. Without in in grid interconnections, if we can't move supplies across Europe, we will have no market. Uh, point two, diversification of source. So if we will use gas, let's get some other sources besides Russian gas uh, in. Point three, uh, energy efficiency. I think you're spot on. That's often low-lying fruit. Travel around uh, uh, our own, my country here, you will see the 1970s Soviet-built buildings, which are um, the, the way you, re you regulate heat is by opening the window in the winter if it's too hot and closing it if it's too cold. Um, there's plenty of scope for improvement, uh, not only in our economy. Um, three, four, uh, increased use of renewables. Um, basically, the sun shines and the wind blows for free. The cost is simply in harnessing and transmitting uh, the energy. And point five, um, it's a political point. Uh, learning to speak with a single voice with third country energy providers. Uh, we don't quite have the legislation in place. The European Commission now finds out after the fact what the agreements were. Uh, from Parliament's point, we want the Commission to be part of the negotiation to uh, add that element of uh, continuity uh, so that, say, a supplier like Russia holds all the cards uh, and each individual member state or companies negotiate as individuals, if we could negotiate in some sense collectively, 500 million consumers will get a much better deal than say a country like ours, which is two. I'll try to answer the questions as well. And also I want to make a quick point. And one is that the affordability issue is the fact that basically we've always not had an equal playing field. So let's be very clear. Elimination of fossil fuel subsidies should be one of the things that we need to look at if we're actually going to start looking at affordability. And then we can start to talk about an equal playing field. The other is we do need to look at our taxation structures, by the way, and that comes back to affordability. One of the issues in terms of the price at the pump of fuel is often that we have huge taxes, and that's a revenue generation. So we need to start talking to governments about how we deal with that, because they're not going to give it up anytime soon. Coming to the five points, I just wanted to make those clear points first. Oh, sorry, and adding to the affordability, let's make sure we start to talk about costing externalities because we haven't done that, and that's part of what the carbon pricing aspect is. And yes, it is going to be a tension between what is affordable and what isn't, but then we need to start talking about winners and losers, compensation, figuring out ways so that the citizen 
when it actually does have to choose its energy sources, is making the right choices. And that's partly our responsibility as stakeholders in this process to make sure it works. So, what do we need? Clear and consistent long-term goals. We absolutely need a strong ETS and carbon pricing policy. And we need a split between supply and demand. And we need to enhance the demand ratio within our considerations of supply. The most efficient supply is demand. It's energy efficiency, and if we deal with that properly, and we may need to consider putting in place some kind of exchange to ensure that actually countries who are looking for new supply solutions are absolutely taking into consideration demand first, because that is the cheapest solution. Securing investment. EU security depends on access to finance, not just fuels. If you want to get investors excited in the new European energy plan, then please start getting out the right signals, enable them, decrease permitting times, decrease red tape, ensure that we get the conditions right for investors to invest in Europe and give them the right signals. Integrated infrastructures. Investment choices should look beyond outdated barriers between energy systems. We absolutely need to look at the smart grid system. We need to ensure that we've got the right distribution and storage systems in place. But again, as I indicated, we absolutely need to look at demand side management. And in particular in the non-ETS sectors, which is the low-hanging fruit, as you indicated. Because if there are fears that we're going to distort the ETS market, start with the non-ETS sectors, for God's sakes. We can do so much more in transport buildings and appliances. Energy system resilience. Explicit stress testing and stronger governance can improve EU resilience. And we must have, we haven't even talked about governance here, and that's absolutely fundamental. Do we need another agency? Do we need an observatory? But also, what are we doing to ensure that we have an integrated plan at the national level? And then responsibilities as well as rights. Cross-border supply solidarity should be matched by effective, as I said, management of energy demand. But it also means that we need to bring in those new actors that I was talking about. You referred to the consumer, the prosumer, the citizen, also the energy intensives, the manufacturing sector, the low carbon producers. They absolutely need to be part of this. And, and the last point, which is over five, but is very important, is yes, we need a neighborhood and global perspective. And we cannot forget as I said, that there are many other markets that are developing much faster than our own and that are starting to deploy these technologies. And we are losing our edge. So let's use a low carbon energy union as the way in which we can really start to enhance our economy and stop being the laggards because everyone's saying that we're a dated economy and that investors are looking elsewhere now in emerging economies. No, let's bring investors back to Europe. Thank you, Christopher. I would like just to, to say a few words about energy efficiency, which was, which was mentioned uh, right now. I think that energy efficiency is a very important part of the deal, and the energy charter is a part of the energy charter process as well. And so we are actively helping uh, partners in, in the European neighborhood, which are our members like Turkey, Moldova, Morocco, in assess the energy efficiency needs. And it, indeed, this is a, we see it as a part of the energy security dilemma. Energy efficiency should be considered in this framework very clearly. Regarding the five, the five uh, points to the, Euro, to the energy union, some, in some aspects I will agree, in some I would like something more or disagree with my predecessors. Well, I think the key element is, and on, on what we agreed, all of us, is investment, the right investment climate including investment protection, and to, be, to have a predictability in the decision of the, on the European and the national level. We have seen, and uh, we have seen in the Energy Charter Framework as well, that abrupt changes of the energy policies are disastrous for the, for the investment climate, are disaster for investors, and then will uh, back, backfire to, uh, and it is, it is poisoning the investment environment in Europe. Second, I would, I would uh, talk about, the, of course, the need of internal connections and the removal of any internal barriers, physical, uh, legal, and psychological. Well, I think we are, a lot of, we are talking a lot about the need for, for cooperation, but we have seen that while some of the projects are not developing quick enough because there are some certain regional patterns and they are not really clearly uh, economic or, or, or legal. So they're kind of psychological and, and presumption of cooperation, not cooperation with certain partners, even within the European Union and immediate neighborhood. I think the third element is energy efficiency. I th but I, I disagree that this is a low-hanging fruit. If this would be the case, well, we would be living in a different world. 
it's, it's a very easy to talk about energy efficiency, but very difficult to find the right incentives how to bring them. And in fact, incentives are not on side of energy efficiency. So it, to, 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 we have to, to, to define in the energy union a right way how to incentivize energy efficiency on the market level. And then legal, the fourth one, the legal framework with cooperation with, on a global level. Well, we have, to, we have to see beyond Europe. We have to see the, the horizons beyond the immediate neighborhood of the European Union. We are part of the global world. So we, we, are, the, we are recipients of, of energy from outside. We are, we are price takers. So very much what, whatsoever we are paying for energy is decided not in Europe. It's decided not on all markets. It's decided somewhere else in, Europe, in, in the world. So we have to take into the, this into account, try to build up a stable and predictable energy architecture for, for all major players in, around the world. And fifth, I would, I would advocate that we have to, to be technologically neutral. Well, we are very much looking forward for the, for the uh, carbon-free uh, energy and economies. But we have to keep in mind that we are still living now and, and today. So, and the, we have to think on the transitional period and we should not exclude any particular energy from the energy mix. By, by making uh, additional obstacles from point of view of the energy energy union, I think that the openness, open-mindedness, which will allow the technological innovation, even even uh, disruptive innovation in all sides of the energy chain, starting from the supply, cons cons transportation, consumption, is very important to be able to 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 grasp the all possibilities of the future technological development. Thank you. I think we have um, gold in our hands because what we need is um, a basis, a structure, a foundation, and we have that. That's the internal energy market. And what we need, of course, on top of that is a vision. And we have a vision too. Our vision is that we want 40% CO2 reduction in 2030 and beyond that 80% in 2050. If you have this, then you must only use the instruments that there are to enforce that. And I think there's a lot in place. So what is the action number one should be that we implement and enforce what we have already. Um, the internal market directives, the third package, um, the policies like, like the eco design uh, directive. Let's use it. Um, there was a question on energy savings test. I know that in my country, in the Netherlands, it's obligatory when you can do investments as a company that have a payback time in energy saving of less than five years, you are obliged to do them. But there's no enforcement to it. Your test could be an instrument to help for that. And I am sure that there are many more like, uh, policies like these in, in many more countries. So let's first start doing what we already agreed. Then, as I already said, give carbon a serious price. So repair the ETS, really and make sure that there are also supporting uh, policies for the non-ETS sectors. I think in the end, that is um, the most effective instrument to make uh, uh, CO2 reduction uh, policies, including energy um, savings, energy efficiency um, uh, work. And then um, um, two specific points for gas. As I said, really prioritize the infrastructure projects this is not wasted capital, as was uh, suggested in the, in the last question. Because if, if we would think, well, it may, it may take some time, and, and can we use it 30 years from now, we would never have had a gas grid in Europe at all. And I think we are happy that we have one, because it, it, it made our climate much more um, better than it, than it used to be when we were still burning coal everywhere. Um, and my last point, put the TSOs around the table and create li liquid hubs in central East and Southern Europe. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank our speakers. Um, they came here prepared to give many presentations, and I made their life miserable by um, make giving them questions instead. And I think it's made the panel really interesting and with real worth for the work we have to do ahead. So I'd like to thank them very much indeed. Okay, straight away over to the internal energy market because we're running late. And we're now going to have 35, 40, 45 minutes on the internal energy market.
Okay, ladies and gentlemen. No matter which discussion we have when it comes to the energy union, within the first two sentences, people mention the eternal energy market. It's the, the bread and butter, it's the meat of what we do. And again, we, we have an exceptional panel. We have Monique Goyens, the Director General of the Bureau of um, Energy Union Consumers. Close enough. But it's consumers. I'm right about that. Um, Elmar Tayan, the chair of the CEEP Energy Task Force. Welcome. Alberto Potoshnik, the first and therefore the greatest head of ASA. Olaf Yulsuf, I apologize for my pronunciation, the chief executive of Energy Norway. And Bente Hagen, the vice chairperson of the board of ENSOE. I will um, give you two different questions, ladies and gentlemen. The first is as follows. When we started writing the internal energy market directives, a long time ago, I remember it, 10, 12 years ago, we had in our minds something different than we had today. We had a mind, in our minds a market whereby a company in France, EDF, would be selling to, able to sell into Germany with exactly the same ease as if it was selling in Germany. We had a vision of a French consumer going onto the internet and saying, I think I'm going to buy my electricity from Aon in Dusseldorf or ever. We're not there. And I'm not sure that we have today the legislation, the regulation, and the institutions that are going to get us there in the short term. So Commissioner Aris Kenyatti was talking about regional initiatives to get some quick wins. Okay, let's, we've seen the, some of the gains that we've had with the Pentilateral Forum. So let's, let's take those gains, replicate them, same as um, Gertjan said uh, just now, and then make them European. He also mentioned that, well, is the institutional setup with ASA, NSOE, NSOG, is it ideal? Is it really going to get us to that vision that we want it to be? So the energy union, in a way, is, is, a, is a commitment by our heads of state to take these difficult decisions that will get us to that vision that we were looking for. How are we going to do it? What needs to be done? Um, so perhaps what I will do is perhaps start with Bente and um, ask the panel along. Just talk. Yeah. Um, thank you. I was allowed to have three slides. Of course, please. <laughs> uh, keep going. Can I? Yeah, it has Next to be. slide. Next slide. This is our contribution to the energy union as NSOE, adequacy forecasts, 10 year network development plans, and market platforms and network codes. Next slide. We will invest 150 billion euros towards 2030. This will enable 20% CO2 reduction in the power sector. We can enable or enable 60% uh, renewables of the total consumption, and the power prices will go down with up till five euros per megawatt hours, much less, uh, much more than than the investments. So this needs to be done. Next slide. We are um, ab about to create the largest multinational power market in the world. I think US will envy us this. Uh, we have one daily auction involving 23 TSOs and five PXs. And uh, this cover now 85% uh, of Europe. And in 2015, we will cover almost 100% of Europe. 
and the benefits are huge. Lower pri prices, lower emissions, improved utilization of generations and grids, and improved system security. So this, is, uh, this has been done on a voluntary basis, now it's in the codes. Next slide. So the next step towards the energy union is to facilitate energy mix coordination at regional level. This will be difficult, but this is very important for 2030. Establish markets across all time frames. And we need to implement network codes. We have now 100, no, we have 1,000 pages of new laws that we're going to first adopt 2015, and then we're going to implement them. So all the people that have been working on regulations need to now work on implementation. So this is very important. And then we need to facilitate infrastructure investments. We need, uh, we need um, a stable regulatory framework and permissions. Not burden sharing uh, systems like André Melin proposed. This just delay our investments. And uh, define coordination mechanisms in energy scarcity situations. So just coming back to your questions, um, uh, you said that you had another uh, vision when you, uh, early on the consumer in France uh, buying, buying electricity in Sweden. And um, this has not been, uh, been uh, solved, but what we do is that we have a very liquid wholesale market now. And if each member state just keep track on the margin from the wholesale price to the consumer price, this and make the competition there so good that it, this margin is small, we have done a lot. So that's one thing. I think also the regional uh, initiatives should be, uh, should be increased. Um, we, we are harmonizing European laws now, uh, it's good. But the pilots, the, the, the best practices is in the regions. They start in the regions and then they become European. So we need to think about two things at the same time. Women can that. We just, we, <laughs> We can, we can harmonize Europe and we can also uh, and work in the regions. Thank you. Thank you. It was quick and short, thank you so much. I would agree with a lot of those points. Um, um, just a short word about SEEP. Um, we're providing public services throughout Europe. Our members are employing 65 million Europeans, uh, which is one third of the workforce. And we are responsible, our member companies are responsible for pretty much everything from public health service, from waste to water and of course energy. What we do need is a, a reliable policy framework from Riga to Rome and we don't have it. And I think this is something, um, it takes 10 to 15 years to have an interconnector between France and Spain. So to take 10 years not to have a common market is absolutely understandable. Um, we don't have that reliable policy framework and this is making for investors it really very hard uh, to invest. We need second uh, to develop um, the electricity market design to address current challenges and uh, future developments. Meaning right now uh, we face uh, at least in the CWE region um, the integration of renewables as one of the main tasks and it has a direct impact on energy security, security of supply. A lot of uh, speakers already talked about it. Uh, we need the right hard and software. Hardware is interconnectors and um, that is the most important thing. Software in this case would be network codes and of course le legislation throughout Europe which is um, understandable. A Polish company in the moment is able, uh, uh, or a Czech company, um, to buy from Vattenfall uh, the German lignite um, power plants and production. Um, but they would have a hard time to understand the German system, how to sell electricity to the customer. Uh, so we do need a reliable framework on the European level which makes it possible to sell electricity as easy as milk and butter. 
And my fourth and last point is might be the hardest to achieve, and uh, I think the contribution of our friend or friend of the earth showed it. Um, our members tell us that every day we need the acceptance of the European citizens, and we don't have it. We have to explain that these ugly electricity lines, that these gas pipelines, don't harm their health, but supply their hospitals and homes. And we don't do the job. We absolutely don't do the job. And neither the Commission, nor the national parliaments, nor um, a regional uh, minister in Bavaria called Seehofer um, is understanding that we have to do that from top to bottom. And of course, we have to include NGOs, we have to include and we have to get as partners NGOs like WWF or Friends of the Earth to do so. This is, I think, the most viable question because in Central Europe at least, and also our colleagues from Spain and Portugal tell us those, it's almost impossible to get the interconnectors through. So we need the support of the people and we have to explain why this is important, why an interconnector is the most important thing to build right now. That's for the moment. Thank you. Olaf. <coughs> Sorry. In electric, we think that our customers should expect the power always to be on, always available, at competitive prices within a framework that decarbonizes the power supply. <coughs> you know, electricity is a fantastic product. It's really at the core of modern society. Uh, and it's sort of, you mentioned the vision 10 years ago. Uh, what should be our vision now? Well, we've seen progress. Market coupling from Gibraltar to the BNC is definitely a step in the right direction. But we need to do a lot more. And it's a lot about execution. Uh, so the day ahead is going ahead. The intraday is a spectacle. Uh, it's not really, uh, it, it's taking too long. It should be, uh, um, it should have been in place already. Uh, and I think it is important that we go into some of these details and see how can we really make a push on this. Not only 10 years ahead, but next year. We need to get the uh, ETS going. Uh, it, we've used 10 years in developing the system, now it should be working. Uh, we need to do those things uh, both in Parliament and, and uh, as suggested in terms of developing it. We have a, uh, I think uh, Maria van der Hoven uh, said it very good today, she talked about local success and system failure. And I think that's also a, um, a quote that's quite relevant for the whole European debate. We need to develop the system further. And it means that using markets, technology and consumers to improve flexibility is certainly uh, key. And then at the same time, if introducing capacity markets, we need them to be technology neutral, uh, open for all kinds of, of uh, uh, participation, and of course through, through interconnectors. In the retail market, we need clearer roles, uh, more transparency, and, uh, and then you will also see uh, a, a, an easier choice for consumers. It's too, too many things put into the bill already. Uh, and also 10 years ago, we argued that we should get rid of uh, uh, price regulation on the retail side. Uh, that's been sort of, in all these conferences for 10 years, that's been sort of talked about. But it's not yet done. With the current price levels, it should actually be a, a good time to do it. So I think there's, and we need to go into the institutions. Uh, a stronger role for uh, European institutions uh, uh, such as ACER. Uh, I guess from the power industry side, in electric, we think perhaps NCE has had a, a bit of a too large role. We can sort of look, look at how, how that should be going further. Um, but fundamentally, it's rebuilding the trust in European markets, both that they are European and that they are markets. And I think that's, in a way, the uh, sum of the core uh, of the challenge. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, I said uh, in my improvised speech that uh, it's important to uh, engage with consumers. And um, so uh, it is important not only to talk about consumers, but also uh, to engage with them. Engaging with them means listen to the consumers and listen to the silence of consumers and wonder why they are silent when it comes to energy. Uh, if I can be a little bit, uh, maybe not politically correct, but I heard that last week at a conference and I thought it was such a good example, saying that energy supply is a little bit like toilet paper. You only care about it when it's missing. And uh, I thought it was really, you know, saying what it wanted to say. But uh, so if you really, so you have to say why are consumers silent and what can you do to make them wake up? 
And if I can just make a proposal to you, because you said that you would talk to Friends of the Earth Europe and WWF, happy that you talk to them, we work a lot with them, but they are not consumer organizations. And consumers are uh, some sort of a, uh, sometimes disappointing uh, group because they do not behave like you would like them to behave and uh, expect them to behave. And so the expertise on how to speak to consumers and listen to consumers is with the consumer organizations, even if the environmental organizations have a lot to contribute to the debate. Now, on your question, uh, from the consumer perspective, I think that <laughs> it's even more premature to talk about cross-border uh, consumer contracts because we already struggle at local level to have competition and to have a real retail, a vibrant retail uh, energy market. Because even locally, in the, national uh, in the national markets, in many markets, it doesn't work for consumers. There is not really competition. And because for a competitive market to exist, you need uh, clear prices, you need mobility, you need clear information, and you need uh, competition on prices. I just would like to say there that together with Euroelectrics and Eurogas, uh, my organization is trying to help consumers a little bit, to push them into that direction of availability of information uh, by trying to standardize the presentation of offers. It's not stand no alignment at all of prices or of con contract conditions, but just to make it possible to have a standardized presentation so that consumers can compare on what is comparable. Uh, that makes it also, uh, already easy. Uh, on prices, I totally agree with uh, your remark about wholesale, uh, the fact that wholesale, a reduction in wholesale prices is not translated into retail prices, and this is something that consumers do certainly not understand as far as they are aware of it, and there should certainly be some uh, pressure on, on this element. A new topic that we have been working not so long, so we have not a full position on it yet, but we are going to monitor that m much more closely than before. And some of our members, the Germans and the Austrians, are already uh, working quite uh, strongly on it. It's about capacity markets, because we believe that uh, capacity markets, if not well de designed, uh, could uh, lead to uh, consumers subsidizing totally uh, not cost efficient or cost inefficient uh, uh, factories or uh, suppliers. And that's certainly something that we do not want uh, to see uh, happen. Uh, and I would also, and I'm not sure that I agree with what has been said on the first panel about uh, technologically neutral transition. I'm not sure that that's something that consumers might want because then you can keep those very inefficient uh, plants uh, going on and that's maybe not the right signal to give to the market. Um, last introductory um, remark, I hope I, there will be a second round. It's about uh, smart technology, smart technologies. And the internal energy market is a lot about smart technologies, smart grids, smart meters, demand response, network codes. And please be aware of the fact that technologies are only as smart as the people who use them. And so, uh, so that means that if uh, you really want smart technologies to deliver what you expect them to deliver, then please design them, taking into account those who need to use them. And for the moment, this is not the case. It's an it's a uh, a offer-driven Te technological move, and if it's not going to be taken up by those who need to use them, I speak of, about domestic consumers, then it will be certainly a lost opportunity. Thank you. Alberto, I'm very much aware that as director of ASA, the question you don't want is how do we complete the internal market, what do we do with the regional initiatives, and what do we need to do in order to reform, if we need to, ASA and the ENSOs, in order to achieve our dream. I know you don't want that question, however you've got it. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going through, well, thank you. For, first of all, thank you, Christopher, and thank you for, uh, uh, for, 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 for the opportunity to be here. Um, I don't know whether I will address all three points in your question, um, but I would like to go back, in fact, to your original question. Are we still pursuing the objective of a single market? across the European Union, or should we downscale it to a sort of regional approach? I think at wholesale level, I think we should still pursue, in, in, in many respects, the objective of making sure that trading between Portugal and Poland is done ceteris paribus in the same way as you can trade within France. And I think we are getting there. 
in, in, in many respects, not all, and in fact there are still a number of challenges ahead of us. I have a presentation, I'm not going to go through it. Uh, I, I'm only using four maps and one chart, if I, I'm allowed. If I can get the first map, please, which should be two slides down, please. Can we have another one? Sorry, another one, sorry, three. Okay, another one, please. Yep, that's basically, I think, what Bente and others have referred to. This is where we are at the moment. This is the day ahead market in electricity. We already have a single market across much of the Union. Gibraltar and the Barren Sea were already mentioned. Uh, we also have a regional, a large region in Central Eastern Europe, which is coupled separately from the rest, separately from the blue area. And Italy and Slovenia should join the blue area sometime uh, this year, soon in fact. And uh, we hope that the sort of brown, the 4MMC, the sort of brown area would also join. So we, are, we will soon have, as Bente was saying, much of the European Union under a single, uh, single day ahead market. Why do we need this? Why do we need a single market? If we go to the next slide, we see the value that we are destroying. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, please. Uh, the value that we're destroying by not having such an efficient market. Uh, well, you have to believe me, uh, there are a number of, of, of um, borders in, in Europe where for 30% of the times or more, electricity flows in the wrong direction, from where it is more expensive to where it is cheaper. Here we are destroying values for consumers, because we are using expensive electricity to serve where we could use cheaper electricity. Why is that? Because of the imperfection of the markets. Through market capital, we can solve that. Now, this is, the, this is a promising, this is a positive story. I don't have many maps as good looking as this one, in fact. Uh, in fact, this is the only one. Uh, I have other maps. If we can get to the next map on, 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 on in my presentation, please. Or you, you, it's, it's, I think it's the next one. No, two ones down, please. Another one. Yep, please. One more. Okay. This is gas. This is actually um, the regions where we have, um, well, I wouldn't say coordinated, but at least a platforms managing capacity allocation. We are much behind where we are in electricity. Gas is a different sector. But at least, again, there is an effort of trying to create a European market. I mean, don't be tricked by the color, you know, by, by the fact there are the colors, same colors along, um, sort of across major region. It's not the same concept. But at least the gas sector until three years ago was not moving. Now it is moving. And there, there are pro promising developments. So uh, these are sort of two fairly positive um, uh, pictures of what's happening in Europe. And I believe both in electricity and in gas market, more in electricity, we should still pursue an objective of a European-wide approach. Regional initiative, yes. In fact, regional initiatives have been instrumental. In their head market, we would have not got where we are if we were not for some regional, starting from the Nordic, but then Central Eastern, cent sorry, Central Western Europe, they were all started with regions. Region, regional um, approach can also help for security of supply. We saw this stress test from the Commission saying a cooperative approach is obviously more effective uh, in delivering security of supply. Um, if I can get to the fourth map, um, we also believe that in order to create conducive um, conditions for liquid um, gas trading, we need to go through the regional route. We need to merge what the sort of areas which at the moment are too small to sustain competition, etc. In 2011, regulators um, developed a target model for gas. They also identified a number of criteria. We tested last year how these criteria are actually um, sort of performed on the ground. I have another map which may be eventually coming up on the screen of where we are. <laughs> if we can get the fourth map, please. Um, on the screen. It's further down, further down. Sorry, further down. <laughs> no, 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 sorry, beyond, go beyond. No, no, keep going, keep going, keep going. That's for, for tricking people. Uh, I, I, more, please. 
another one, another two or three. Well, whenever you get the, 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 the next map, <laughs> you will see that this is my interpretation of where we are. And you will see where we are with the next one, sorry, that should be the map. Okay. That's where we are. This is the application of the gas target model criteria to the different member states. The darker the greener, the better the local market, gas market is. The darker the, the red, the more problem we have. And it's clear there is a, a large region where there is a lot of red, but there, by integrating the markets at regional level, we should move towards the green. So I think there is still role, but we have to be pragmatic and we have to be flexible. And for retail, I think if we get the wholesale right, I think we will already deliver good, good um, uh, benefit, tangible benefits for consumers. And that's the story for another day. That's fantastic. Thank you, Alberto. In a way, I think you've got beautifully one of the objectives of the energy union, turn that dark green. Um, okay, panelists, why are we doing this? It's about the citizen at the end of the day. It's about how much our citizens pay for their electricity, for their gas, and it's how competitive our industry is, jobs and growth. And I was reading the IEA um, outlook. Our industry, our energy, industry, our energy intensive industry, our SMEs, pay 50% more for their energy compared to Chinese or American companies. Our households, about 5% of their um, dis dis available income on energy, which is 5% is fine for folks like, like us who have a good job. If you're poor, it's not very funny at all. So at the end of the day, it's about citizens. What do we need to do in the internal market now to bring the benefits to citizens. And if I could just ask the, the five of you that question very quickly. Um, I think we need to act on all that we know. I think we have the solutions to most of the things that we need to do to have a competitive Europe. Um, uh, so, um, the only problem, I'll come back to what we have to do, but the only problem I see that we haven't solved is, uh, is the backup problem in the future. Uh, in 2006, it was over a week without wind in, in the North Sea. UK, Germany, Nordic, France, no wind for over a week. So if we have the same weather pattern in 2040, what do we do? So this is my own, oh, only worry. That's the most important worry. We need to uh, put um, uh, R&D and, and, uh, and uh, the industry into solving that problem because we are going to have renewables. We're going to have uh, uh, cheap renewables in the, in the future, but we need backup. But that was... My, my biggest worry on the future. But how, how uh, should we act now? Uh, I think uh, that we ha what I usually say when I'm back in Norway and I'm challenging people, I say the first directive, the second directive uh, of electricity uh, were successful but not enough. The third one will be successful because they have, or we have written, thousand pages that really uh, if we implement it's a true integrated market but we need to implement it and it's not just uh, it's it has to be pushed uh, and we have to do it much faster it took 18 years with uh, with the market coupling it has taken that was on a voluntary basis but uh, but uh, intraday has taken too long Balancing is also a challenge. Uh, it's very difficult to have a harmonized balancing market, but you should start in the regions. So we should put all our efforts to, to uh, push and do it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, this is uh, the main, main thing. And then uh, we need to build an invest grid. That is a no-brainer. And uh, I think the countries that have a financial difficult situations should be uh, prioritized in the CEF funding. And um, 
I think um, we should put renewables into the market so they have to have to uh, pay the same system cost as as others and um, we need a stable uh, regulatory regime uh, for investments uh, both for 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 uh, grids but also we need a stable ETS system so we can have an investable um, ETC, ETS price. So this is my, my um, I think this is my, my way of saying how, what to do and uh, we could start just doing it. Thank you very much, Elmar. Um, I would underline everything and now I would like to get to the prices. Um, I think the price component that is determined um, in the competitive field um, is uh, quite low in many member states and um, in particular that for electricity uh, the price reductions in this component and they are immense in the last years I mean the price has fallen from uh, base load electricity from 100 euros per megawatt hour in the peak times of uh, 2008 uh, to right now 30 euros per megawatt hour in the electricity market um, those price reductions have reached the customer but taxes and levies have been increasing and are the main driver and as long as the member states don't acknowledge that and don't see that taxes and levies are pushing the prices up um, those low wholesale prices won't reach the customer and uh, member states have to address this issue and I don't think that it's the issue of the industry our power plants are struggling. Our power plants are not able, we are not able to invest anymore. I mean, we have a serious problem here in investing. And in future, yeah, the price will skyrocket because there won't be any power plants anymore for the security to, to stay in for the security of supply. And those old lignite and coal, hard coal power plants will be out of the market as well as the nuclear power plants. So I think member states should address the issue of um, taxes and levies. That's one important thing uh, and uh, you shouldn't blame um, it on your electric or on the companies or on the TSOs. Right now in Germany we have about 55% um, of the electricity price track which is 30 cents per kilowatt hour per to use uh, is state organized. Thank you. Um, First, I'd like to say that I very much support the, 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 form, the two former interventions. I think Bente Hagen's analysis of what needs to be done is, is, is very clear, and, and your point on taxes is, in a way, where I also start. I think the taxes and charges over the last five years has, uh, uh, has increased more than 100%. Uh, it represents, well, over 60 euros per megawatt hour for, each, for a typical household in Europe today. Um, so if policymakers are worried about competitiveness or the prices of energy, it's very much in their hands to do something with that. Um, uh, and I'd like to add that, of course, from parts of the manufacturing industry, there's also a worry that a well-working ETS, meaning also higher price, have implications on competitiveness. Well, that, that money doesn't disappear. It goes to the governments. Governments can choose other places, other areas, to enhance competitiveness and uh, also for the industrial consumers we've seen increase in policy costs and taxes. So the uh, increased revenues from a strengthened ETS also gives governments opportunity to enhance competitiveness in other areas and there's also a particular compensation scheme for that matter. Uh, so I think it should not be um, uh, um, counter, sort of a strong ETS should not be um, against uh, added competitiveness for Europe, rather to the opposite. Uh, and the, the government uh, sort of part of uh, the price is, is huge. And I'd like to add one point there that goes as much on regulation as the price directly. In many countries, uh, power supplies are obliged to to do things on insulation or on poor customers, uh, the energy poverty uh, 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 approach. Well, the question is what should be government policies and what should be energy markets? If you want efficient energy markets with strong competition, you need to make them transparent and open. 
if you put very many obligations on the companies, it's not that transparent anymore. So to develop social welfare systems, that's important, but that's something else than uh, uh, tinkering with the, with the energy market. And if you look at the consequences, take, take the UK. Uh, UK companies have a lot of obligations uh, when they sell power. Uh, because of those obligations, of course, you need to have a regulator that follows that up. Uh, is that really the, the uh, uh, true cost? Uh, how did you do with the fixed cost? Uh, you know, all the data the regulators would want to see because it's sort of a monopoly service. And to follow that again with strict fines if you don't do it. And to follow that again, of course, the companies then need to be sure that they are in compliance. So one of the large UK companies have about 100 people to make sure that they comply with the rules. Of course, and, and with the regulator then having loads of people to follow this up. And the question is, of course, for the consumer, they see a lot of costs and they claim that energy is uh, expensive. Uh, if we're able to separate these obligations, these public obligations, to the government and to say that, well, the energy should be energy, and of course, these other services, smart meters, uh, added services on energy, energy related, uh, then you get competitive markets going, then you get as Bente said, you would also get margins down if, if, that's, an, if that's an issue. Uh, but it will anyway be more transparent and easier also to have a competition that's strong. So there's some sort of vicious circle in putting more obligations on companies that are supposed to be in the market and not be a government service. So I think you started with what would be best for consumers. Well, it goes through the whole value chain. I think there's a clear disconnect today between um, uh, the expected uh, investments going forward and what the market is telling the marketplace that they should invest in. So going back to my theme that one of the key themes around energy union should really be to rebuild trust in the markets. And then for the grid, we need to develop more interconnectors and the stronger grid. Uh, and we need to use more technology to pick up uh, the uh, flexibility both with consumers from generation and to uh, minimize investments in grid because we should do it as, as cheaply as we can. And then we need to get the retail market work, get rid of the uh, regulation in terms of prices, uh, take away the obligations and put them somewhere else, and then you will have more open and transparent markets as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf. I've been told we have three minutes. So I will give two minutes, 55 seconds to Monique. So did I understand you correctly that you would like to get rid of regulators? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so the first thing I think uh, we should do is, uh, from the consumer perspective, I only talk about, I only have this legitimacy, of course, is uh, look at what's existing as regulatory framework, look at all the tools that exist and start enforcing them. There are a lot of tools that exist and that are not enforced. So uh, uh, there should be much more closer monitoring of market behavior of energy companies because there is uh, unfair marketing practices there, misleading marketing practices, and that's certainly against consumer trust. Second point I would like to say, um, also to change a little bit from the, the usual <laughs> discussions, it's I think really that the way forward is energy efficiency, energy savings. And I think that much more space should be, much more space should be devoted in the energy union package to eco-design, energy labels, uh, the circular economy. And there are quite mixed messages coming from the Commission when it comes to those uh, topics. And I think there should be a much more ambitious and straightforward commitment that that's the way forward because that's the most cost-efficient way of being en energy uh, secure. And, um, also, this is a way of tackling energy poverty. And if you do that with smart financing, you can really help those who are, who are struggling to pay their energy bills uh, by having more uh, energy, um, uh, less, less energy consuming uh, housing or appliances. And last thing I would like to stress, um, which has not been mentioned, because energy is beyond electricity and gas, but as a consumer organization, we also believe that much more should be do, done in order to push for more fuel efficient cars because that's also a big part of the consumer energy bill. And even if uh, fuel prices are low for the moment, this is just an accident of history. They will go up uh, soon, and we have to prepare for that, and we should not be dependent on that part of the energy market neither. Thank you very much. Alberto, do you want the last word? 
sec five seconds, I guess. I'll give you ten. Okay. Um, three, three, dimension, three, three parts of the answer. No, no. But in, uh, first, complete the work at the wholesale level. I think we have the instruments. We, have, we just need to implement them. We need to complete the, the rules, uh, have them adopted. Uh, there may be some incremental improvements, but we, don't, we have enough to, 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 to get to work. And I think we need to implement all the rules that are being developed. Secondly, we need to make sure that suppliers can access markets. Uh, they can reach consumers. We can't expect consumers to look, go out and look for suppliers. Suppliers should be able to enter into national markets. Consumers do not want to go much beyond the national borders, but we should create competition in the national, within the national borders. And third is engage consumers. And that, I think, I'm always puzzled that the energy sector is ranking close to the financial sectors at the bottom in consumers' attitudes ranking. And I don't know what we've done wrong. Obviously, something uh, we have done wrong. I think we need to, not, I mean, energy efficiency is fine, but I would be even more ambitious. I mean, we need to make them actors, proactive actors, in a sector which is changing. We have a new paradigm. We need to have a more flexible sectors. They, can only, only, they cannot only reap the benefits, but they can also provide value for this sector and make money out of it. They have a lot of opportunities at their hand. At the moment, they don't switch, when we switch, they switch for the wrong supplier. Ask at home how many in our families know what a kilowatt hour is. Everybody knows what a gigabyte is, not a kilowatt hour. I think we've done something wrong, or not enough. That's very good. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've, um, during the last two panels, I've noted down what came out most, what people talked about the most. First one is emissions trading system. Interestingly enough, we talked about security of supply, we talked about the internal market, and the thing that people mentioned most in my little numbers was the emissions trading system, the importance of having a proper price in the emissions trading system. The second one was efficiency first. Before you do anything else, check whether you can do energy efficiency cheaper because it's the best form of energy we have. The third is the need for liquid competitive markets, and the fourth is technological neutrality that when you have real technological neutrality and a market that incentivizes what we have at home, you will push renewable energy. And the fourth is, the last one is, don't forget the progress that we've been made. The, internal, the third internal market package, if we implement it properly, and if all the institutions we have really bite the bullet, you can create great things. So I'd like to thank the panel. It was really terrific. And thank you for the brevity and the incisiveness that you uh, gave us today.